Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Simon Glazer, and I'll be hosting today's session. Uh, before we get started, you know the drill, just some housekeeping. We're planning on going for about 40, 45 minutes. But if you have a question, you can submit via your Zoom portal. Uh, we've had some good questions already, uh, so we should be able to cover a lot in terms of what's already come in, and we'll do that as we go. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we've got CPD points available today. Um, and we should uh, have around zip, well, point, point 0.75 um, CPD points available. And I might just take a pause there for a second. I've just been locked out of my screen. So I might quickly introduce Gary Monaghan briefly. Gary joined us last year for a, a webinar um, in October. Uh, and today's focus is around the Fidelity Asia Fund. Uh, so I'll just take a moment to introduce Gary while I unlock my screen. One second. Thanks for joining us, Gary. Hey, um, thanks very much. And, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. While Simon's doing that, um, just a, a reminder that the Fidelity Asia Fund, as, as you're aware, is a, a highly concentrated portfolio, 20 to 35 stocks. Um, we're trying to beat the Asia X Japan benchmark and, and doing that in a basically a go anywhere fashion. We're, we're trying to make money anytime, any place, anywhere. And, and, and although it's a concentrated fund, we, we will, and I can demonstrate a bit later on that there's the, the total risk of the portfolio is actually similar, if, if not at times less than that of the benchmark. And, and, and we're not also trying, we're also not trying to be a value or a growth um, portfolio. We, we go where the opportunities are and there's no deliberate approach as we go through. And, 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 and that, growth versus value, which I just mentioned as one style, that, and that's a real hot topic, which I think Simon's gonna sort of uh, ask about a bit later on. Yeah, perfect, and thanks Gary, appreciate that. The wonders of technology. Um, just a, a friendly fact, both Gary and I are coming to you live from two different places called the same thing, the Gold Coast. Gary's in Hong Kong, I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm in Queensland today. So um, just to kick us off, 2021 is, is the year of the ox, which is, which represents sort of strong and resilient, something honestly that we've had to be throughout 2020 and looking like again in 2021. And, and as Gary mentioned, those words can also be used to describe the Fidelity Asia Fund, which is again, the focus for today. And just to, just to sort of paint a bit of a picture in terms of performance over the past year, you know, the fund has returned just over 23%, outperforming the MSCI Asia X Japan Index net of fees but more importantly, over the last five years, the fund has returned just over 18% per annum, outperforming that same index by close to 4% net of fees each year. Uh, the fund is highly rated and gaining increased awareness as more and more clients become aware of the benefits of investing in the region, but also the importance of active management when doing so. As Gary mentioned, uh, the fund is neutral in style, but often contrarian is concentrated but diversified. Uh, as I said, last year we caught up with Gary and, and Gary's the investment director for the fund. Um, today, Gary, we're gonna have a look through the portfolio and the reasons why we hold some of the names that we do, along with how the process and portfolio construction comes to life. But to start us off and, and looking at 2020 performance, given how strong it was with the Asia X Japan index itself, returning almost 19%. I'll be keen to explore some of the forward looking consensus, consensus and outlook. Um, you know, we know the region's come out really strong from the pandemic. So I'll be keen for that sort of 20 cent tour of, of that consensus outlook for the region, but also uh, how that regional view aligns with our current allocation, if that makes sense. So thanks again, Gary, for joining us. Yeah, no problem. And um... Although we're in similar places in the Gold Coast, I think the big difference, Simon, is um, I think you've got your speedos on and you're going for a swim after this. Um, but anyway, uh, that's another story. Um, so just in terms of consensus for Asia, it's fair to say that globally, and I'm talking about this from a global perspective and, and in terms of the client queries and, and actually the flows that we're seeing into our, not just this fund, but our, our other Asia funds that we sell globally. Um, that Asia is, is definitely somewhat in favour. I think there's this general view of it was first into this pandemic, it's kind of the first out. And it, I would say economic activity somewhat uh, backs that, that view up, um, particularly in North Asia. So we, we're certainly seeing in Asia a divergence between North and South. Um, and 
I, I would say India now, it used to be kind of in the south um, from a, a north versus south perspective, but it's sort of in the middle somewhat now if you're thinking about coming out of this pandemic. Um, the, with that though, having said that, the market has been very strong and this valuations potentially looking a little bit toppy, um, particularly in certain areas, um, you know, in, in the high growth areas in particular, but, but we can touch on those a bit later on. Um, now, what are we seeing just generally across the across the board? Let's go with maybe the more negative um, stance at the moment in this ASEAN. I mean, as you're all aware, I mean, I think it's fair to say none of, none of you have been able to go to your, your annual holiday to Bali or, or, or go off to Thailand um, because ASEAN is basically closed down to tourism. And that, I would say, I think it's fair to say is unlikely um, to open up anytime soon. Um, Obviously, the economies have been hit quite badly because of the lack of tourists going through, and tourism really is a big lifeblood for a lot of these uh, a lot of these nations. <clears throat> and so that has knock-on impact across a whole range of sectors related to consumption, you know, your hotels, restaurants, and all of the money that those people spend. Um, and and so really, what we want to see for, for things to turn around is is, a, is the reopening of these economies. The, I suppose the bad news um, is that to for the economies to open up. Um, you, you're going to need some sort of vaccination program and, and sat here in Hong Kong, for example, I think it's fair to say that for, for, for flights to open and back up to Bali or to, to Thailand, I think the government here will want to see some sort of movement on vaccinations. It's not just about me wanting to go, it's about actually being able to go. Uh, and these, these are some headlines that we're seeing in the last few weeks. And vaccinations in, South, in ASEAN markets, in, sorry, in ASEAN countries, <clears throat> haven't really been secured yet and I think that that probably spells quite bad news for 2021 and the, the opening up of the borders. The uh, possible potential silver lining um, for the ASEAN markets is that the structural change of supply chains from China to, to other nations is still kind of going ahead um, but probably not going all guns blazing just because it's quite difficult to move at the, in these times. I mean the borders as I said are closed and you know, if you if you need to go and build a new factory in Vietnam or Indonesia, uh, it's quite difficult to do that if you can't travel there. Um, so so whilst there are a lot of plans afoot for companies to move uh, some of their production to the ASEAN markets, it's happening, but probably not as I said, at all guns blazing. Um, and if if the world was normal, um, so given that we've we've just got this oh, this sort of niggling doubt in our minds at the moment on the ASEAN markets. Yes, they look relatively cheap versus the rest of Asia, but, but actually the, uh, I suppose the, the, the catalyst for the markets to, to, to come back just aren't really there yet for us. And so um, we, we, we're typically staying away. Um, India is an interesting one. So India was, um, in the middle of last year, was really hit badly by the pandemic. I mean, cases were going through the roof. The, 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 the economy was in a pretty severe lockdown. Um, what we can see here on this, on this chart and it may be quite difficult for some of you to read um, but these are high frequency activity indicators that, that are looked at by our analyst team and, and what you can see is that if we were in April last year I mean year on year things like car sales and real estate uh, uh, sort of um, um, mobility payments all these things were down quite heavily right on during the lockdown and people weren't getting out and about and they just weren't doing things now, what we have seen uh, in particularly the back end of last year and coming into this year is that that lockdown is easing. Things are getting back to, you know, uh, I wouldn't say normal, but they're getting back. Um, and coming from a low base, we are seeing some rebounds in this space. And so that, that's a positive. Um, of course, markets tend to somewhat predict this. And so we have seen a bit of a bounce uh, in, the, in the India market. And, and I will say with India, what we've I mean, we've observed this for a number of years and, and now is no different, is that the, the, the valuation disparity and, and the, the, uh, the returns to investors between the haves and the have nots have been quite extreme. Um, and so what the haves, the, the companies that are, you know, in our minds, are very good, very well fundamentally set up, um, you know, are, are built for success going forwards. I mean, they, they're in the haves bucket. And they've done really quite well and valuations are probably a little bit stretched. The have nots, I mean, they are looking cheap, but they have nots, right? And so it's a little bit tricky to, to sort of delve through a wreckage there and, and find good value opportunities. 
Um, you could argue there's some good value in, in the, let's say down the cap scale in the low, in the small cap space, but then you're coming into liquidity issues. And, and so there's, you know, a few question marks for us around that. Um, what, we, what we've done, and for example, with some of the haves, I mean, we had a holding in SRAM Transport Finance. This is a non-bank financial that lends money um, to secondhand passenger vehicle uh, uh, buyers. I mean, it's very, very niche. Um, once the economy was getting back up and running, uh, you know, car sales were, were taking a turn for the, for the better. Um, their business was getting back up and running. One of the key things as well is that they were able to collect money again from people they'd lent money to in the past, because India is still quite, I suppose, um, sort of old school in, in the, 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 the money collector comes around and knocks on the door. So in, in lockdown, they couldn't do that. When things got back up and running, the stock just absolutely um, took off like a rocket. And we went from around, I think it's around three and a half percent to actually just very recently um, selling out the position completely. Um, and then uh, it, it, we touch on China. So China has been the, I suppose, the market darling. It's been the big outperformer since the, 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 code, uh, the COVID sort of shakeout in March last year. And, and it, it, from an economic standpoint, it, it probably is, you know, the, the, the hottest economy. Things have got back to normal quicker. It, it, if we talk to our, our colleagues in Shanghai, I mean, they're just going around meeting companies and, and doing things like they did before. Um, and, and so things are somewhat back to normal. Um, it's still not fully up and running. Um, international travel isn't happening. People aren't going there and again, doing business. And so it's not, it's not as it was, but from a global perspective, it, it really does, I, I would say, stand head and shoulders above the rest. Now, one thing I, I'm gonna put a point of caution and then sort of maybe go into something a bit more positive. Um, the credit impulse uh, and the economic stimulus that we've been seeing uh, from last year was, was a real positive to the market. It created ample liquidity to the market. And obviously that supported the, the, uh, the, the stock market and share prices generally did really, really well. What we have been seeing in the last sort of few months is that that credit impulse, the, the, the change of, 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 of credit um, is it's still positive, but it's slowing down. And, and this is somewhat indicating to us that that the, the, the government and, and the authorities are, are slowly turning the taps down. It, it's potentially, I think it's fair to say, um, it, it's potentially a view that things are getting somewhat back to normal. We don't have to just basically open the taps and just let people you know, get, basically give out money. I'm overstating it there when I say that. Um, but the, the taps are slowly being turned off. Um, and, and so maybe that liquidity that we saw coming through was finding its way through to the market it is, it's maybe dwindling a bit. Um, I, I'm not going to say it's going away, but it's dwindling. Um, and, and there's actually been some news in the last kind of couple of weeks where there's, a, I suppose, a bit of a clamp down on, on some of the margin financing that, that a lot of the brokers were, were doing, which was finding, again, finding its way to the market. Um, it, it's not an, an overall, it's not a huge negative, but it's something to be aware of. The, the one thing that I will point out, to, though, is is that on the right hand side, this is the uh, sort of the growth in, in sort of real assets, the fixed assets. And what you would I suppose, typically expect to see is that as, as credit goes up, as debt goes up, it finds its way into the real economy and, and the real economy um, kind of areas do really well. But as you can see, they haven't actually really taken off. And this is indicating potentially that some of the credit that's been offered and some of the debt that's been taken on um, it has just been out there just to service fairly I suppose, uh, let's say fairly bad industries and, and maybe pretty inefficient industries as well and so some of that debt that, that's been accumulated is, is basically just almost a bit like rent it's kind of dead money um, and so so do be aware of that too um, but it's not all negative and we are seeing retail sales pop back and and the the, the Chinese consumer which has been a big driver of the China market for a number of years you know, continues to go, go along really quite nicely. Um, obviously, we're still not quite back at the levels that we were at before, um, but, but we're, we are returning there slowly. What I will point out, um, and this is true for China, it's true for pretty much, I would probably imagine every economy globally, um, if you were to look at it now, is that online retail sales, uh, you know, have continued to hold up really well. 
they're popping back quite nicely. We're in year on year sort of uh, high team percentage growth, which is already from a high base and pretty attractive. Um, and, and so the, the, the online sort of story, the e-commerce story um, is still a structural growth area for China. Um, and, and yeah, despite the fact that there are, I suppose, holes in the economy, um, there's, there's concerns around the growth of, of real assets, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there are still pockets of opportunity, but, and it, there is the but here, valuations are, key, are crucial here as well. So, I mean, the chart that I'm showing you is not, it's, it's not a, a fidelity insight. This is something that anyone could get hold of. And, but it, but it, there are stocks that you can kind of pick through to, to, um, to make money over the long term. Yeah, good stuff. I suppose, uh, you know, sweeping statement, definitely still cautious across the region, but showing signs of positivity and opportunity. So I appreciate that, Gary. And, you know, you mentioned there the online retail and probably just reflecting on the portfolio a little bit more. Uh, can you talk us through some of the changes in the portfolio last year? And, and I note that uh, Alibaba has found its way in after spending a long time on the sidelines. Have you got yeah. any comments there? Yeah, um, I'll touch on Ali sort of uh, a bit later on. If, if I talk about it from a high level first, um, what did we see last year? Well, when the market was going through, uh, I suppose the, the, the height of the turmoil in March, we were big buyers and, and you can see the sort of the spike up um, around sort of March and April last year. Um, when the market rebounded, we were trimming into that. And for the last sort of few, I say last few months, probably last sort of five or six months or so, we've been fairly flat in terms of number of names, but there's been some turnover. So we've been buying something and selling something. Um, and and the, the other thing to point out on the right-hand side is active money is still high, but you can see that downward leg um, in, in November last year. And that is, as you're alluding to, Simon, when we bought Alibaba, obviously it's a big benchmark holding. Um, in, I mean, it's a big, I think it's number, well, today it's number two, um, in terms of the Asia X Japan benchmark and by owning Alibaba for the first time, it actually ate into some of the active money. <clears throat> um, but, but we are, we're not um, trading, I don't want to, we're not traders, but we're not, we're not sort of turning over the portfolio in the same way we were sort of 10 months ago or so. That, that turnover has slowed down, um, but we are sort of picking through the market and trying to find opportunities where, where, we, where we can. The opportunity set compared to 10 months ago is, is much thinner. Uh, you know, markets are, are, are more expensive. Um, a lot of the, I suppose the, the stories around rebounding of the economy in China and things are, are, are already playing out. And so uh, it, it's harder than it, was, than it has been to find new ideas. Um, just to touch on a very high level of what we've been doing, as you can see on, on the left-hand side is January last year. Right-hand side is, is current uh, positioning in, in the middle is, is where we were six months ago. Um, financials uh, is, is an area that we've actually you know, significantly reduced. Um, one, one is just that financials on the whole um, were underperformers during the COVID sort of uh, crisis. Um, no real rhyme or reason for it in our minds other than people have muscle memory from the global financial crisis Thought, oh my god the, the market's going to you know it's, it's going to hell in a handbasket what should we do oh the last one financials were the baddies and so that kind of triggered some selling that that was something that we saw but we shouldn't be complacent and particularly in the asian markets we, we, we were concerned that we'd see non-performing loans increase just given that the economy um, you know was in a pretty tough state with with no tourism um, and so that actually helped led us to to sell in bank rakia um, more recently so in the last six months or so we've been reducing quite significantly our position in aia um, if i was talking to you probably 12 to 18 months ago it was a top three position um, at times it was almost touching 10 percent of the total portfolio as well um, but the story there around its move into china uh, and the China growth opportunity that it has is, is, is somewhat playing out. And so on the relative strength of the stock, we've, we've just continuously been trimming into that. Um, so, so that's a big reason for the financials. And then I mentioned Shram Transport Finance as well, which um, is the stock we've held for a couple of years. Um, it's been doing really well since that sort of rebound of the, you know, of the Indian economy um, and, and we sold that position. So, so that's been a big change. Um, on, the, on the other side, you can see IT um, has been a, a big mover for us. 
And, and when I talk about IT, I'm talking more here around sort of the hardware and semiconductor space. And this is actually an area where we see real structural growth over the next few years, at least. You, you can obviously, you know, we, we all know that our, our, our sort of demand for technology is increasing. You know, work from home, cyber security for, for businesses, all of these things that are just creating a, a huge push uh, for demand uh, in, in, in the semiconductor space. And so, so what we've been doing is, is going through the, the supply chains, see where the, I suppose the pinch points are in the supply chains and who has pricing power and, and, and adding to that. Because we, we, we feel that there's somewhat, in a relatively unstable world, there's somewhat some, uh, there's some stability uh, for earnings growth in this area. So uh, the likes of SK Hynix, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, is, is a position that we added last year and is currently uh, just looking right here. To, as, as of right now, uh, it's 5.8% of the portfolio. Um, TSMC is a stock that in in March, April and, and uh, in March, April and May, we were trimming into relative strength. Uh, but suddenly we went from about 3% position to 9% um, on one day in July when Intel announced that they could not compete in the, uh, in the chip manufacturing space. Um, on that announcement on that day, the, the industry structure changed. Um, there was potential competition from the likes of Intel in, in chip production. Um, by coming out and saying, we cannot do a seven nanomo chip, um, for our processes, and we're going to have to outsource that now. The, the, the industry structure in the, in the chip manufacturing space changed to a true, a true duopoly, um, uh, where it's very clear that TSMC is just head and shoulders above the rest. And uh, we, we saw that as a huge potential for more pricing power for TSMC. Plus, um, we also knew that Intel would have to outsource a lot of that chip production that they failed to do themselves <clears throat> and so they only had two choices you've got samsung or tsmc and tsmc is the best in our minds so straight away we just added quite heavily into that into there as well um cash more recently has gone up uh the markets as i've mentioned already markets have done quite you know really quite nicely valuations have just become a little bit more expensive and we're sort of as we're trimming into that relative strength we're holding some of that in cash. We, we are recycling some of the proceeds into, into the higher conviction ideas in the fund, but, but also we are increasing the cash. And the way that we're thinking about cash is if, if we're, you know, we're a high conviction portfolio, we're, we're a concentrated fund, we don't want to go half-hearted into an idea and we would rather hold cash and wait for a better entry point rather than go half-heartedly into something. Um, it's kind of a bit of all or nothing type of mentality, if you like. Um, but but if if we go into something half-heartedly and it doesn't do well, and you know we, we're not sticking by our process, right? It's like, well, we just bought something for the sake of it. Um, however, if we go into cash and maybe it's a drag or, or maybe it's not, we can understand it. We know why, and we we I suppose that opportunity cost, and we understand what it is. And so that, that, that's certainly something that we've. Uh, that, that we've seen more recently is the cash has gone up a bit. The, the final one I'll just touch on on this one and before I move on is the uh, communication services. Um, we, we bought our first communication services stock for, for many years now, probably about two or three years. Um, it, it's a, a, a Korean uh, sort of a company called Kakao. Um, Kakao are basically like the WhatsApp of Korea. Um, a huge monopoly position, you know, messaging services. And, and through the messaging services of the, the cacao kind of line, uh, the cacao app that they have, um, they're, they're creating a bit of an ecosystem. And, and what we're finding really interesting is that at the same time, we've been, we're seeing a lot of deregulation of the banking sector in Korea. And they're actually using that, that ecosystem to create a payment system, um, similar to mobile payment systems we see globally. Uh, and this is really taken off in Korea. And so it's using the, the, the ecosystem that it's got, the, the, the network that, it, that it's created, and it's basically, um, uh, it's, it's basically using that to create this payment system, which in our minds is really, really interesting, could be a huge growth driver for the stock. We've been adding to that more recently as well. Today, it's a 3.2% position. 
Now we'll get on to quickly now, Simon, because I'm conscious of your the, of your question on Alibaba, and I'll skip the next couple of slides um, because there's a couple of examples. I've, I've mentioned SK Hynix, who've been buying Galaxy. Uh, when I put this together, we, we had Galaxy. Galaxy was up about nine percent yesterday, so we trimmed the position quite heftily um, yesterday. Um, and Tektronic is, is the top position for us as well um, that, that, that continues to do really nicely for us. Um, but oh, sorry, on, on Alibaba. So this has been the biggest change in the portfolio um, in, uh, well, probably throughout the last six years in terms of going from zero to nothing, I would say. Um, as we stand, to, as we sat here today, um, we've got a 9.8% position in Alibaba. Um, if I was talking to you four months ago, we had nothing. Um, so if, for those of you who joined the call uh, last October, uh, I, I probably said to you that we like the e-commerce business. I hope actually I have to go through the recording. I hope I said this. <laughs> um, we, we like the e-commerce business in, in, of Alibaba and, and we always have done. It's, it's a very, very strong ecosystem. It's, uh, you know, the market leader in Alibaba. And as I mentioned earlier, the structural growth drivers that are, are you know, uh, for, e, for online are absolutely you know, up and running and roaring ahead. Where our concerns were, one is that we felt that the, the cloud business that they were developing is you know, it was still loss making um, and it, it's really a highly competitive area. Now that hasn't changed and that's still a bit of a niggling doubt in our minds. But our biggest concern was that, that, that no one was pricing regulatory risk. Right? And, uh, and where, you know, the valuations are very high. Everyone was loving Alibaba and Tencent and all these names. Um, but there was no talk about regulation. And so that was a real problem for us since we, we didn't own any of these names. <clears throat> let's, pass, let's go to November and suddenly in November, we had two really real events that impacted Alibaba, but actually I suppose um, solidified our view around the regulatory risk. And, and once that came into the market, it's been talked about, priced in, we've got comfortable with it and we, we like the e-commerce business. So let's start the IPO um, for the Ant Group IPO um, I suppose halt um, or cancellation or whatever you want to call it. I mean, that was a big doubt first and foremost for the, 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 the market. It, it, it highlighted to the market that the Chinese government um, is aware um, that companies are getting very big and that, that the Chinese government has, let's say, a long arm that can, that can impact businesses. And that was certainly something that was a, a problem. That got us very interested because the stock price obviously was hit, but it didn't fall enough. Right? And so we were monitoring it and saying, OK, well, is there anything else? What next? Um, and then a couple of weeks later in November, you, you saw that the Chinese government came out with a, an anti-monopolistic um, uh, uh, sort of draft paper. And, and what this basically said is that the e-commerce businesses and the social media platforms were creating an ecosystem that once you were in it, uh, as, a, as a consumer, you couldn't get out, right? So, so in the most basic form, let's say you're buying something on Alibaba's Taobao um, e-commerce platform, you could then really only use Alipay to, to, to purchase, right? So you, you didn't have a free, as a consumer, you didn't have freedom of choice to use other payment systems. <clears throat> and so they, they were treating that as, as anti-monopolistic behavior. That, that kind of regulatory risk coming through and the threat of, of I suppose, action on, on monopolistic behavior really spooked the markets. It wasn't factored in by the markets at all, really. And Alibaba's share price fell about 30 odd percent or so. We bought into that because we're saying, okay, great. At last, we, the, the, the elephant in the room in our minds on, on regulatory risk is, is, is out there. Um, people are really scared about it. That's brilliant because it, it creates a potential contrarian opportunity and, and let's not get away from the fact that Alibaba does have a, the best e-commerce platform out there. And, and, you know, we're hearing, and we're still hearing it now, lots of things like, well, this is about um, the Chinese government taking over Alibaba. Is this the death of, you know, the, the, the internet names? Um, well, actually, we don't think so. We're going to take a, we take a different view to that. Our, in our minds, what we, what we believe is that, the, the, one, the government just is putting regulation to catch up with the, you know, the, the fast moving pace of the internet space. And, and I think that maybe you can sympathize somewhat with that. It's a different story, but I, I know in Australia, you've got all these issues with Facebook and Google and, and around news feeds. Yeah. 
you know, that it's a, it's a, it's a different factor, but it's still it's regulation and the regulators trying to catch up with these internet names. Um, because it's China and you're talking about the government and regulation, everyone just thinks that, oh, okay, this is a disaster. And, and, and so maybe that, that kind of view of, oh, God, that's China, um, it, it's playing on, on people's minds and it's just, you know, people are staying away. We sat there going, well, it's regulatory, um, sort of, it, it's the regulator implementing rules in the same way that they're doing in the US and potentially, you know, in Australia and other markets. There's no huge difference in terms of that big picture. Um, and then more about is the government there to try and sort of take over Alibaba? Well, China is actually about creating national champions, right? The, the, the policy is to try and make China this, you know, the, 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 the global leader. And, and I think it's fair to say that the, the, the government is very aware that, that, that it needs the likes of Alibaba to, to, to create these global leaders, right? Alibaba has been quite successful in moving into areas like Southeast Asia, with the Lazada uh, platform. Um, and it's a huge brand. It's a really well-known international brand. And, and it's kind of, a for a lot of investors, it's kind of the gateway into China as well. Um, and so it, it's really about understanding the business. It's really about making sure that it's creating a level playing field for other firms as well. It's not about taking over and kind of like conquering it. And, and so with that in mind, we, we've been trimming into the strength as people kind of get het up and, and a bit, you know, kind of um, uh, concerned about it. Uh, and, you know, we've very recently has been a, a, a contributor to us, but we, we've got a lot of com uh, comfort that the regulatory risk is priced in. We think it will be a 2021 event. Um, you know, it's kind of being played out already. The, the rules are being solidified, you know, as, as we speak now. Um, there's been a couple of very minor fines. I mean, fines that I think Simon's bonus could probably pay for. Um, you know, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they haven't, you know, they, they, they've not been in the, in the billions of dollars um, but the, uh, we sat there thinking that the, the outlook is actually quite attractive and these guys really are great in the e-commerce space. The final thing on Alibaba, which we, find, which we have found quite interesting, is that the other e-commerce and internet names have basically shaken off this. And so if you look at Tencent, for example, um, the stock price has done really, really well. Um, and it's kind of what we've seen in the last, num last probably five years or so is Ali and Tencent, the correlation was quite high. In the last three, four months, that correlation is broken. Um, and, and there's an element, again, in, in the back of our minds, that there's some sort of mean reversion. And that mean reversion, hopefully, is, you know, is Alibaba catching up rather than Tencent kind of catching down. Um, but, but we're comfortable with it. It's a big change. As I said, we were 0%. It was the biggest underweight for us even four months ago. Today, it's, it's, um, it, it's a 9.8% position. So it's a real, real hefty, uh, hefty position for us. And given what I've just talked about, it's, it's, it's relatively contrarian. I mean, a lot of our other PMs uh, across Asia have, have somewhat trimmed into this into this news. Um, but at the same time, they were, they were heavily into it before. Um, but yeah, we, we've we've taken a different view. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And you know, again, just thinking about sort of the conversation last year, obviously the failed Ant Financial IPO. One of the conversations or themes that's Sort of running in the Aussie market is that the IPO window is well and truly open. You know, that's probably more so in the smaller micro cap space, but nevertheless, there's a lot of activity there. Can you sort of make any comments or has there been any activity in terms of the IPOs throughout your markets? Yeah, um, the, the, the IPO market in, again, this is kind of the North Asia um, sort of comment and particularly China, uh, the IPO market has is, is been, is been blazing. Uh, to be perfectly honest, <clears throat> the it's kind of it's two, a couple of reasons. One, yeah. and, it, and it's sort of a perfect storm if you're the Hong Kong exchange. I think it's fair to say. Um, one is that we've seen the US consistently attacking Chinese companies listed in the US. Um, you know, they're, they're they're threatening delisting, and there's all sorts of things that have gone on for the last eighteen months to two years. So a lot of the Chinese companies listed in the US, like Alibaba, like JD, you know, all these big names, they, they've, they've decided to dual list uh, in Hong Kong. And, and what they've actually done as well, not only have they dual listed, when you dual list in Hong Kong, they, they make the stocks in Hong Kong what they call fungible. So if you own a Hong Kong stock and you own a US stock, 
they enable you to transfer your US holdings into Hong Kong. So it's kind of an easy, it's kind of an easy way. You buy the buy the stock in, in Alibaba in Alibaba, say in Hong Kong, then you can transfer. It's not quite as simple as that, but you can, you know, with, with some help from your operations teams, you can transfer the, the stock over. <clears throat> so, so that's been a big positive for the um, uh, for, for the IPO market here. The second one I would say is, is around, and this is very true for the A share market, is the Starboard. You may you may have heard about the Starboard, which is a uh, kind of it's kind of China's Nasdaq equivalent. They they set it up I think about eighteen months ago or so. Um, oh, and uh, I've lost my screen. Um, sorry. Um, they set it up about 18 months ago or so, <clears throat> and it's meant to be uh, the NASDAQ equivalent. And, and what that's done is it's brought a lot of privately owned uh, sort of private equity type companies. There are hundreds of them in China that, that were really, 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 really quite big in the, in the international in scale. Um, and finally, they found a home that they could go and IPO. So the Starboard, um, our traders in, in Shanghai, it feels like every day I'm getting an email saying there's a new Starboard listing today. Um, to the point actually where at the latter end of last year, the Starboard was actually big enough to create its own Starboard index. Right, So that's, that's gone from zero to, to very big in a very short space of time. Um, another one as well, which I think is sort of interesting, it's quite interesting, is the, the 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 stock connect and and that whole stock connect story as you're aware you can buy a share stocks in listed in shanghai and shenzhen through northbound stock connect um, via hong kong so if you're an aussie investor you can buy through via hong kong um, a share stocks on the on the reverse if you're a mainland investor you can buy hong kong listed stocks via what's called southbound stock connect and, and what we've actually seen is a lot of companies somewhat trying to take advantage of that and maybe listing in Hong Kong to, to try and get not only international money from you know, Aussie investors and European investors, but, but using Hong Kong as a base to get, to get access to that huge wall of cash that the mainland Chinese investors have. So, so there's, there's a couple of things that have really been quite nice in, in that space. Now, what we, we've been quite active in the IPO market. Um, I, I was talking, we were talking about this the other day. Um, for the first sort of three or four years, I think we can recall maybe one IPO that we participated in. Um, in the last sort of six to nine months, we, we participated in probably about four or five. Um, so to give you a couple of examples, um, Lufax was, uh, is, is, a, is one that actually we, we participated in around the same time as the Ant IPO. So Lufax is, is a company that was, is a parent company of Ping An Insurance Group. Uh, and they do fintech as well. Um, it's a different type of fintech to, to Ali, which is pure sort of online and, and kind of you know, virtual money and payment systems and these things. Blue Fact is a bit more about lending uh, and I would almost call it, I'm probably doing it a disservice, but, but, but basically sort of traditional type of lending, but doing it via online. And, and where we found this to be quite interesting is that someone like Alibaba and an ant group that it owned, they were a tech company coming into the, into the financial space. And typical kind of tech mentality is, you know, no, and I don't mean it in this way, but no disregard for regulation. We're going to go and stamp on everyone's toes. You know, we, there's so much inefficiency that show them. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes that gets people a bit annoyed and regulation comes in and gets in the way. However, Lufax came from Ping An, and Ping An is a big insurance group with a, 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 sm a smaller but decent sized bank attached. And so these came from the most regulated industry that you could imagine. And, and so rather than going like Alibaba, thinking that the, the, the whole space um, was, was there for the taking and regulation was just you know, was a, was a hindrance, these guys understood it, but felt that fintech actually was it was much freer than they've ever been, right? So it's a different side of the coin, uh, but they understood it, and so they understood things like you need capital on your balance sheet. You know they, that, that that kind of simple um, sort of banking mentality came through. So we felt that that was an interesting one. Bought into it, um, that we made a little bit of money. We we have sold it since. There are a couple of concerns uh, from us that the uh, the the, um, uh, the 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 annual uh, rates that they were charging uh, that they were getting and um, probably won't be quite up to the scratch that we thought that they could achieve um, but we made some money nonetheless um, we've just bought uh, a, 
a company called Kuaishu Technology. It's a social media platform in China. It, it's one of the hot topics in, in, it's one of the hottest kind of social media platforms out there. Um, you've got the likes of ByteDance, which own TikTok. You've got Tencent's WeChat and Kuaishu is, is really, um, if you want to call it the new kid on the block, the, 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 the newest sexier app. Uh, on the social media platform that's coming through. And we, we bought into that um, and we, we're about 1.2% actually of the portfolio. Um, another one that we bought is a company called Mingyuan Cloud. Uh, Mingyuan Cloud. And, and one thing I just will point out when you're talking about Chinese IPOs, they all have things like cloud and tech on their name. Mm. They're not always that tech related. It's just it is to attract some of the retail interest, I'll be perfectly honest. But China Mingyuan Cloud, um, basically these are a software company that do sort of the virtual reality software um, that, that goes to estate agents. So they, they work with estate agents. And this is particularly meaningful at the moment where if you want to do a virtual online um, tour of, a, of an apartment or something like that, the, the, the technology that you need um, for the AI um, sort of virtual reality um, sort of uh, a view that they can give is, is developed and produced by Mingyuan Cloud, and so it's a it, and it's got a real I mean, it's got a real life use. And with lockdown and obviously, as I said, China's getting back to normal, but people still aren't just walking into anyone you know a house as and when they feel like it, like they used to. And, and so the demand for this from estate agents has, has gone up quite significantly. Mm. Um, so there are a couple of that that we participated in um and yeah we've made at times we've made some really good money on the ipo market and we are aware you know we're in these stocks for long for fundamental reasons but we're also aware that you're in it there's a lot there's a wall of money particularly for mainland china that follows and then um, you can make some good money in the ipos yeah and if it hits your sort of your price targets then it starts to question the investment thesis around it right well yeah yeah we had um i mean we, we bought into one called um rlx technology um, and the, these guys are they, they provide some um, some of the apparatus that go into e-cigarettes right and uh, we i'm going to get the days wrong but basically ipo on the tuesday um and on thursday by thursday it was up over 300 percent um so we made 90 basis points on an absolute level we made we've made 90 basis points in three days basically on rlx technology um we didn't think it was going to we, we could see that money could be made we didn't mm. think we thought it could be three years not three days um so but when it hits your price targets or it, it starts to get a bit crazy then we sell yeah yeah that's definitely a very interesting part of the market but um probably a good um bell approach to you know the core the core parts of the portfolio that have been grinding away for quite mm. some time look gary we, we're getting up to time but we do have a question around ESG and integration of ESG in particular, you know, we were talking earlier um, around some of the themes in the portfolio. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could probably just talk to how uh, you and Anthony and the team look at ESG and, and, and yeah. it finds its way throughout the portfolio. Yeah. Um, ESG the hot, it is the hottest topic in town. And, and, and actually, it's, whilst you're sat there in Australia, something you should be aware of is uh, a, a European regulation uh, that's coming into play on the 10th of March um, called SFDR. And SFDR requires um, funds that are listed uh, or, or registered in Europe um, to, to label themselves um, in, ter in terms of the, integrate, the level of uh, ESG integration that they have. <clears throat> um, and why that is important is because it's something that impacts the entire fund industry because a lot of firms like us, as traders, BlackRock and everyone else, you know, a, a lot of their sales are done in Europe. And so their funds have to be compliant. And so, and so with that, you have to prove ESG integration. Now, at a firm level for the last 18 months, every single stock that we look at is rated on a financial outcome. So you think the stock's going to go up. So one means strong buy, five means strong sell, but also on an ESG outcome. So A being strong ESG player, E being like, you know, complete laggard and don't touch it with a barge pole. Um, that those ratings uh, that we're seeing at the fund at, at the firm wide level um, are those ratings we're seeing at the firm wide level um, are obviously filtering through into the research process, right? Because the, the analysts are now always thinking about ESG and, and how you know how it impacts the, uh, the companies. What I will say of ESG is that a lot of ESG is actually it's just a, 
it's fundamental analysis actually it's about governance board structures and such which a lot of people do where maybe ESG has been lagging and where everyone I think needs to catch up is on the E and the S side of the coin um, you know how do you measure impact environmental impact and how do you measure social impact and what does it mean on the company and um, sometimes these things don't have an impact on the P&L um, and, and so therefore the, the share price hasn't really reflected that in the past I think going forwards as we sat here today with SFDR regulation with um, for example in, 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 in Germany you know as a pension fund if, if you've got pension money you have to have exclusion lists you know all of these things are, are things that we, you have to think about now because it's it's a structural change that's going to impact the market um, and so with with that in mind we integrate and we're more about integration and engagement rather than exclusion and so when we're thinking about ESG from the fund perspective we think about how is ESG a risk you know what is, is there something <clears throat> on the horizon that could be a potential risk to the business from an ESG perspective and is that priced in and, and so we see it more as a risk factor. There are other funds out there which much more exclusionary, the norms-based approach to ESG um, and, and kind of more sort of green sustainable. Um, we're, we're, we're much more about integration and, and thinking about it as a risk factor and is it priced in. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that's here to stay. It's a topic we're on top of, but there's a lot of room for improvement, not just for us, but the industry. Yeah, appreciate that. And I think it's, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of work to be done across multiple uh, industry sort of regimes, sectors, asset classes, yeah, you name it, but it's definitely front of mind for a lot of our investors. So I appreciate your comments there. Just conscious again of time, we've just run over 45 minutes. So we could literally probably spend another 45 minutes talking about the region uh, and also the strategy. So Gary, thank you very much for your time today and a special thanks for everyone who's joined us. Uh, really appreciate your support, not only for attending today, um, but also your support in terms of in terms of Fidelity and Fidelity Asia in particular. If you do have any further questions, uh, please reach out to the team. We will send a follow up email uh, with further information and copies of the slides today. Um, and a reminder that CPD points will be available. It, it tends to take a couple of weeks or at least ten working days. So with that, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. And bye for now.